Um, we do these presentations every Wednesday, and next week we'll be talking about wildfire. Uh, we'll have some time lapse and aerial photography from some guest presenters. We'll be talking about fire ecology and post fire policy, the good and bad, and we'll be sharing funds raised from that program with the Opal Creek Ancient Forest Center. A link to that event is live right now on OregonWild.org, and it will be emailed out with the video of this program tomorrow for everyone who's registered. Now, we had such great turnout for our last snowshoe webinar at the end of last year on Central Oregon that we decided to do this follow-up presentation about snowshoeing around Mount Hood. I'm going to turn things over to Eric Fernandez, the Wilderness Program Manager for Oregon Wild, and he's going to give you a short overview of Oregon Wild for those of you who are new to these programs, and then dive into some tips, tricks, and places for making the most out of your winter snowshoe adventures. Take it away, Eric. I'm going to go. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, and welcome to everyone. Um, I'm going to jump into screen sharing mode here. But um, as Aaron mentioned, I'm Eric Fernandez. I've been uh, with Oregon Wild for 20 some odd years and uh, have led, led a number of snowshoe trips um, to a number of places around Mount Hood, perhaps with some of you uh, in the past. So um, let's, uh, without further delay, jump right in. So Aaron, I'm going to screen share. Let me know if uh, when that comes in, OK. Is that looking okay, Aaron? Yes, sorry, I muted myself. Okay. All right, great. Uh, so I put this uh, first slide in here uh, just because it's been, as Aaron mentioned, a pretty wild and crazy day. And um, hopefully folks can uh, take a deep breath, exhale, um, and we can uh, enjoy a moment of uh, thinking about something uh, not overly political and uh, think about getting out into nature. Um, so let's let's uh, move along here and um, get into the presentation. So as Aaron mentioned, we'll, we'll do a little bit of background on Oregon Wild, jump into some discussion on gear, some tips and some safety issues, and then um, focusing on some pretty pictures of places and suggestions on where to go and when to go there around Mount Hood. Right. So Oregon Wild, uh, we're a nonprofit conservation organization. We work on uh, protecting, among other things, wildlife habitat. So uh, recovery, as you can see here, of uh, wolves in Oregon, um, wildlife and, and birds in the climate basin. Um, and yes, Ewoks as well. Uh, for those Star Wars fans out there, you'll know that Ewoks live in redwood trees and forests. And uh, most people don't realize this, but Oregon does have some redwood forests down on the southern Oregon coast near the California border. Uh, biggest one is about 15 feet in diameter. So um, can to protect that Ewok habitat uh, here in Oregon. Uh, we also, uh, in the past, have worked to protect places like the Mount Jefferson Wilderness Area, um, places like Mount Hood, um, passed the legislation uh, with help from a number of partners in Congress uh, in 2009 to expand protections for a number of places around the mountain. Mount Thielsen, another area we've worked on protecting over the years, often referred to as the, the lightning rod of the Cascades. Uh, this is just north of uh, Crater Lake National Park. And then Strawberry Mountain Wilderness, another one um, that we helped protect. If uh, most people have not been there, if you have, you know it's a great place to beat the crowds. This is in the, the John Day River watershed. Um, pretty neat spot, uh, pretty remote. And then in uh, Central Oregon, uh, the Three Sisters Wilderness here, uh, another one we've worked on. So I have one quiz question. Uh, this is the only quiz question I'll ask you, uh, but what percentage of the state of Oregon do you think has been permanently protected? So we're looking at, you know, border to border in Oregon, how much of the state do you think has been protected? And for this exercise, we're thinking about uh, wilderness protection. So the sort of the gold standard uh, for public lands protection, um, strongest permanent protection. And I'll, I'll give you a hint. Uh, the state of Washington has protected about 10% uh, of their state uh, and the state of California has protected about 15% of their state, a bit more progressive state. 
So Oregon, we have not lived up to our green environmentally friendly reputation. We have only protected 4% of the state. Um, I'm, I'm a little competitive, so this is embarrassing to be so far behind. And perhaps the most embarrassing part of the statistic is um, our, the, the liberal progressive bastion of Idaho uh, has actually doubled us up and protected twice as much uh, percentage wise of their state. Um, so we have more work to do to protect our natural treasures, our wildlife habitat, our clean drinking water. Um, uh, you know, there's no, no way to interpret this as a balanced approach to how we uh, protect our, our state. So to that end, uh, what are some of the places Oregon Wild is working to protect? Um, we're working on protecting more wild and scenic rivers in Oregon throughout the state. Um, it's a great way to protect fish and wildlife habitat, recreational opportunities. Um, you've got the South Umpqua there on top and then Odell Creek in Central Oregon on the bottom. And then around Mount Hood, um, working with a number of partner organizations um, to try to find a, a better vision for Mount Hood. Um, anyone who's been up there recently has seen the overcrowding, the mountain is really being loved to death. Um, and, and we really need a better vision for how to balance conservation and recreation around Mount Hood. Um, we're in this outdated model um, of a, a plan that was written, the, the management plan for the Mount Hood National Forest was, was actually written in the 1980s, finalized in 1990, um, not equipped to handle um, the current status of conditions on Mount Hood today. Um, it was written in a time when logging was a dominant feature. And so because of that, logging is still a prominent issue that we're dealing with around Mount Hood, rather than trying to find sustainable balance between conservation and recreation trail systems. Um, so uh, that's something that I think we're, we're hoping to see Congress step in and, and chart a better path forward that protects the most important vulnerable areas, creates uh, sustainable recreation, helps uh, get access to our public lands for uh, people from all communities around the mountain, um, including underserved communities who have not traditionally had as much access to the mountain, um, by making it easier to get there, um, and not just putting in more parking lots, but um, finding ways to do more, uh, in non-COVID times, carpooling, more public transportation from the gateway communities. Um, so looking for solutions um, for a better vision for Mount Hood. That's something that um, we're actively working on. All right, and, and as a part of that plan, um, some of the places that we're hoping to see protections for uh, would be Bluegrass Ridge in the foreground here. This is the Upper Hood River Valley. Um, it would include places like uh, Boulder Lake, which is uh, just south of the Badger Creek Wilderness, um, Tamanuas Falls, uh, this is uh, right off of Highway 35. Amazingly, uh, just north of the trail, this area is threatened. Uh, just a thousand feet north of the trail, there's a proposed logging project. Um, so we're still battling those issues and want to see these, these natural gems protected for future generations, for carbon storage in the forests, um, and for recreational opportunities like snowshoeing. Speaking of, um, let's dive in. So I'm going to pop out uh, of screen share here just for a moment. So snowshoes, um, kind of the basics for snowshoeing. A lot of different kinds of snowshoes uh, you can get out there. There are generally two different uh, models. Um, one is what you see here. This has the metal frame, bar frame that goes around the edge and then this webbing. Um, you'll notice that kind of where your foot sits here. Uh, you've got these sharp teeth underneath. And this is probably the most common. The other common type is the, uh, the more rigid plastic. They're usually red. Um, and those work really well. Those tend to have more teeth on the bottom for better traction. So they can be a little bit better um, when you're out on icy conditions. But for the most part, my advice when it comes to snowshoes is don't overthink it. Uh, for most of the snowshoeing that you and I and, and our friends are going to be doing, it's day trips where we're going three, four, five miles round trip. Um, 
and, and you can use pretty much any snowshoe you want and be just fine to do that. If you're going to be wearing a 40 pound pack and you're doing, you're going 10 plus miles to do some snow camping, you want to make sure you have the right snowshoe. Um, so remember that and I've, I've led trips over the years uh, and I've seen people put these things on all different ways, frontwards, backwards. I have not seen sideways yet, but um, that could still happen. Um, in general, with snowshoes, you get what you pay for. Um, the buckle systems, usually there's going to be uh, a couple of this type of buckle that you'll do. And then there's a, a strap that goes around your heel, pretty standard. Um, sometimes you'll have a little bar back here behind your heel that you can flip up. That can be helpful when you're going uphill um, and definitely not helpful when you're going downhill um, or you don't have to use it all. Um, and then, um, yeah, one thing I, I want to mention here, when you're putting them on, um, the, really the only thing you really want to make sure is you don't put your foot too far forward. So you can see this snowshoe has, has a brace right here where it won't let the boot go too far forward. If the boot goes too far forward, it's going to start rubbing against the webbing up here. And that's going to change the way the snowshoe works. So when your boot is all strapped in correctly, you'll have this loose heel function where the, the snowshoe, as you step, the back of the snowshoe will drop down. And that's helpful because as you're going along, you're going to have snow that kind of gets on the snowshoe and just the weight of the snowshoe. You don't want to have to pick that up as a with every step. So that's very helpful function to have this loose heel that comes up as, as you step. Um, and if your foot's too far forward, it's going to kind of lock you in and mean you're carrying all that weight with, with every step, every mile. So that's one thing to, to be thinking about there um, with the snowshoes. Um, I, I would also suggest with the snowshoes, um, if, you're, if you haven't tried snowshoeing yet, um, try renting them first. Uh, there are a number of places uh, where you can um, get to, you can rent them from uh, whether it's REI uh, or the Mountain Shop in Portland. Um, you can also, if you've gone out, um, left town and forgot them, a couple of places in Sandy um, where you can uh, rent them. Uh, remember, you know, it's strange times with COVID, so call, best to call ahead, make sure they haven't um, rented all of theirs out, uh, or if you need to make a reservation. Um, so call ahead just so you don't have any surprises. But um, yeah, again, this is kind of one standard model of snowshoe. Um, there's a couple different varieties. Um, and, you know, you'll have, when you put it on, one other, one other tip before we leave the snowshoes, um, and I'm, I'm seeing a few questions in the uh, chat box, so maybe we'll come back to this in the Q&A and, and clean up any that I've missed. But um, one tip is, not to put any of the straps on too tight. Um, you want it to be pretty snug. If it's not snug enough, um, that will uh, end up giving you uh, blisters and you don't want blisters. So if it's, if it's too snug, you're gonna get blisters. If it's not tight enough, um, then it's probably your snowshoe might fall off, particularly uh, this back heel uh, strap. That's where you'll, you'll find it'll slip down. Um, so get it tight. And this one, this one you can tighten up a little bit more because that'll uh, not give you a blister on the back of your foot, most likely. That'll just keep your heel uh, in there. So, and, and most snowshoes have a, a pretty similar type of strap on the back there. So those are the, the, the main pieces on the snowshoe. Um, so let's go into a couple other gear pieces here. Back into screen share mode. Okay, uh, so when it comes to uh, poles, this is a, a question I get a lot. Um, if you like hiking with poles, uh, you're going to probably like snowshoeing with poles, um, but you certainly don't need them. Um, it's, it's definitely just an option. If you are going long distances uh, on a pretty serious trek, you probably want poles just to help even out uh, and keep your balance. Um, and if you're out on an icy condition day, um, then you're also going to want to have those poles just to, to kind of keep you up. Um, so that's, that's my tip on poles. The best kind of poles to get for snowshoeing are the, the adjustable length type of poles. If you have a fixed length, um, that'll work fine most of the time. Um, but if you're in deep snow on a, on a trail that um, has been packed down in the middle but not next to the trail, it can be a little bit of a, 
a pack down trench. And so you'll you'll have your poles up here digging into the sides and that's, that's good, great workout for your shoulders, but um, maybe not so comfortable for multiple miles. So uh, if you have the adjustable kind, you can and fix that. Um, and then uh, layers, uh, this is this is a, a good one. Um, so when you go snowshoeing, typically you get up in the morning, you drive up there, the blood's not flowing, you get out of the car and you're like, oh my gosh, it's really cold. I'm putting on every layer, including my emergency blanket out of the trunk and, and you don't need to probably go that far. That's the coldest you're gonna be all day most likely. So in, in order to try to have a good strategy for, for clothing, best to dress in layers. So if you, if you really do wanna bundle all the way up, uh, you can do that in the beginning, but be able to kind of take some layers off um, and, you know, always make sure to have enough uh, in case the weather does turn. So if, if you're not bringing, not wearing everything, keep it in your pack. So you've got it for later just in case you need it. Um, and then uh, another handy little piece of equipment here that definitely don't need, but uh, can be handy. Um, these are, are called gaiters. And you basically just wrap this around your lower leg and then your ankle would be right here and then your foot comes out here. This little stirrup basically goes right under your heel. And a lot of, a lot of, there are different kinds of gaiters, but they will have this general function. Um, the stirrup basically just holds it in place um, so that your the, the, that sort of crease between your boot and your snow pants, you're not getting snow going into your boot. Um, so that's the strategy for gaiters. Um, some days you totally don't need gaiters, no big deal, don't bring them. Um, but if there's fresh snow that's kind of kicking around as you're walking, it'll find its way into your boots. So gaiters can be helpful. If you have, uh, if you're out on uh, a day where there's a lot of fresh snow and you're cutting uh, trail, uh, breaking trail in, in deep snow, gaiters are definitely handy. Other days where it's a pretty well packed trail, Definitely don't need them. So, and, and they're light and small, so you can always take them in your, your pack. Uh, they can be handy uh, under certain conditions. So for footwear, um, speaking of gaiters, um, the, the best option is to wear uh, snow boots, of, uh, you know, decent snow boots, not the super big bulky ones. Uh, most snow boots uh, will fit just fine. You might have to adjust the, the straps on your snowshoe, but um, should work pretty well uh, and fit all snowshoes. Most snowshoes are one size fits all. Again, unless you have really huge feet. Um, I, you know, when I'm out leading snowshoe trips with 10 or 15 people, I'm, I usually tell folks, you know, look, put these on. We could all trade snowshoes and they'd all work just fine. I could wear one of these and one of those or whatever. Um, and then you start out and everybody, you know, when you start snowshoeing, um, there's this instinct of, I should walk like a duck. I should walk funny. I've got these things on my feet um, when you're out there for the first time. And, and so for 15 minutes, most people walk like a duck, a little funny. And then you realize you can walk pretty much normally. Um, and then you don't even, you don't even think about it that much. Uh, it's very accessible, pretty quick learning curve um, on your first day out to get going, uh, which is, which is nice. And so on foot back to footwear, um, snow boots are, are kind of the best because they have, you know, they tend to go up a little bit higher, so less likely to get that snow in if you don't have gaiters, and they tend to be a little warmer when you're being out in the snow, um, but not essential. You can wear your hiking boots. That's probably what most people wear is hiking boots, um, and especially if you've got gaiters on, you're good to go. Um, waterproof is helpful, um, but not essential. If it's a rainy, kind of wet, snowy day, um, that can be a little bit more helpful, but uh, typically, the snow is frozen. It's not really going to be pushing through your shoes. So helpful, not a requirement that you have full-on waterproof. Um, I've been out many times, and on sunny days on well-packed trails, um, you can go snowshoeing in tennis shoes with sneakers. Um, I've seen people do it many times, and it works just fine. You're more likely going to get some uh, blisters because the straps are going through a pretty thin shoe. So I would recommend that, but uh, it is doable if you um, forgot your snow boots or something, have somebody else cut trail and you can kind of bring up the rear, um, but uh, not recommended, but doable. Um, so that's the story on, on footwear. Um, kind of like with hiking in general, always bring water and food, extra water, extra food, just for being safe and prepared. Um, 
when it comes to uh, maps uh, and you're going out uh, snowshoeing, kind of like hiking, uh, make sure you know where you're going ahead of time. Um, have a plan, have, uh, have a, whether it's a paper map or a map on your phone, there are a number of good apps out there that can be helpful for uh, navigating. Um, even if you're uh, off, out of cell range, uh, a lot of apps will, uh, or some apps can use uh, the GPS function in your cell phone uh, and still uh, kind of give you uh, good uh, coordinates on where you are on the map both where, compared to where it travels. So uh, Gaia GPS uh, is, is one app. Avenza is another app. Um, that's Gaia, G-A-I-A. Um, and so, yeah, a couple of different options there or just the trusty old paper maps. Um, so yeah, that's the, the story there. COVID, I'm not an epidem epidemiologist, so uh, there's lots of information out there on that, but uh, remember, especially if you're up on Mount Hood on a weekend, there's going to be a lot of people around. Uh, have your mask ready and handy. Um, it is you are outside, and there is it's easy to kind of you know get off the trail if you're feeling like people are too crowded in one spot to kind of give them a wide berth. You know, if, you know, it's when you're hiking during the summer. General rule of thumb is you want to try to stay on the trail so you don't damage the vegetation on the side of the trail. Not so much an issue in the in the winter because you're just on top of a bunch of snow. So um, uh, something that we can do, uh, but want to do safely uh, in these times. And then your ten essentials. Google it. Uh, th this is sort of your your safety ten essentials: your first aid kit, your map, your water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if, you know you are out in the snow, so wanting to make sure you've got uh, that good stuff with you just in case. All right, there we go. So some, some other tips, uh, particularly on once you're out, out there snowshoeing. So when you're out there snowshoeing, a lot of times these trails that you might be on might be shared with cross-country skiers. And as you can see here on the left of the photo, um, you can see those very distinct two tracks that cross-country skiers have used. And if any of you have uh, cross-country skied before, you know, it's a lot easier and smoother uh, for cross-country skiing if you have tracks that are um, set like that. And so there's just really, it's really nice for, for cross-country skiing. If you are snowshoeing and you think that's the best spot for snowshoeing and you trample on those, it kind of wrecks those tracks for the cross-country skiers. And that is the golden rule of do not do that um, when you're out on snowshoes. Um, we, snowers, we snowshoers sometimes have poles, um, but cross-country skiers always have poles and they will use those as weapons against you if they see you uh, trampling on their uh, cross-country ski tracks. Um, you will get more than dirty looks uh, for, for trampling on those. So um, golden rule, I've, I've given this presentation in person uh, a number of times and uh, inevitably there's somebody from the Nordic Club and I'll make two versions of it and then the Q&A they'll bring it up four different times, five different ways. Uh, just making sure everybody gets that message. So uh, hard to underemphasize that if you're uh, hearing this as a cross country skier. Um, safety wins in the end. So um, if you're on a trail that kind of narrows down and there's only one safe route and it happens to have cross country ski tracks, uh, just go right over and trample them uh, to smithereens, uh, not a problem. And then once you're out of the narrow spot, you know, if there's a steep spot on the side of the trail, then you can just get uh, get back off of those tracks uh, shortly after. No big deal. Um, you, and you can also, you know, use, use judgment here. Um, if you look at the right side of this photo here, you can see there are some. Uh, you can maybe kind of use your imagination and say, well, somebody may have skied through here. There, there are some tracks. You know, is it okay to snowshoe on that, or do I need to go way off on the right? Um, totally fine. That that sort of setup where it's like. Somebody skied through it, somebody snowshoed through it, somebody maybe walked through it, dog's been through it. Um, that's totally fine. It's really more just those distinct tracks that you want to uh, watch out for. Keep peace in the woods. Um, all right. Um, one, one other no-no with snowshoes is, uh, as we talked about, um, you have that loose heel function, so remember, got the, the heel drops down as the foot stays in place here. Um, if you walk backwards, think about what's going to happen. You're going to lift your foot up, and as you lift it up, the heel's going to go down, and then you're going to step back, 
the back is going to dig into the snow and it's going to dump you on your butt. Um, not what we want. Uh, you know, hopefully it'll be a soft landing, but um, don't don't try to walk backwards. Um, doesn't usually work very well in snowshoes. Complete the circle and you'll be just fine. Uh, don't put your boot too far forward. We already talked about that. Um, one suggestion is um, snowshoeing is a lot harder if you're the first one on the trail or if you're going through deep powder. Going through deep powder is really fun on snowshoes, but it's also really tiring. Um, and you're not likely gonna go very far if you're doing that. Um, so if you're the first one out in the morning, which is hard to do on Mount Hood, you kind of got to work to do that. Um, but if you're the first one out, you're going to be blazing that trail and working harder than the people after you. So if you don't want to do that, you know, somebody else to do the work, um, maybe go mid-morning or a little bit later or midweek uh, or, or, you know, after more people have gone um, to, to pack the trail down and then it'll be a little easier. We were talking about Mount Hood. There are a lot of people out uh, snowshoeing on Mount Hood. So you, you more have to work to be the first one to do it, but it is fun to get off trail and, and try that out. So I, I do encourage a little bit of that. Um, one thing I always encourage folks to keep in mind when it comes to how difficult is a trail for snowshoeing, um, whatever you hear from people, take it with a grain of salt. There are some fixed item or, or fixed factors that uh, affect any trail. So obviously distance is gonna affect how difficult it is. Um, and then elevation gain. So, you know, the things that affect how difficult a hiking trail is. Um, but with snowshoeing, you have an added layer that really influences how difficult uh, any given trail is. And it can change from day to day. Um, and that's snow conditions. So if, again, deep snow, you're the first one there, it's going to be hard. You're not going very far, but it'll be fun. Um, if it's all packed down and, and you know, just powdery, um, that's that's gonna be uh, kind of your more easy conditions. Um, you might still have the elevation climb, but at least the, the snow conditions won't be making it more difficult. Um, if it's icy conditions, um, that might take a beginner easy trail and make it an expert trail. And you may just not, it, it, I generally don't recommend, if you get to a trailhead and you're seeing more than just a little ice here and there, probably best to turn around or maybe try somewhere higher elevation or somewhere else. Um, or save it for another day because snowshoeing on ice, those teeth help, but they're they're not that helpful for really icy conditions. It's just, it's not gonna be fun. Um, speaking of weather, um, that really should dictate um, where you wanna go on any given day. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in the later section when we're looking at um, uh, different suggestions on, on uh, destinations. But um, in general, on, days you want to be in the trees so in the forest um, protected from you know the blowing wind and everything um, on sunny days you want to be out in the open where you can enjoy those views um, out in the open looking at views on a stormy day there are no views so best to avoid those so sunny days enjoy the views stormy days try to pick a trail that's more in the trees um, this is a sort of the, the rules of them and we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of that um, Snowshoeing distance, I, I usually encourage folks, especially if you haven't done it a lot, you know, if you're used to in the summertime saying, oh yeah, I can do up to eight miles, I would say maybe start with four miles um, for snowshoeing. You know, the, the conditions day of may affect that a little bit, but um, that's probably a good rule of thumb. And then if you if you get fine, you can keep going further, great. Um, but that's a, a good, good measurement for at least the starting point. Um, snow parks, passes, all that good stuff. Uh, you, you do need a snow park, um, and that helps pay for plowing of those snow parks, which makes them uh, usable. Um, you can get those pretty much uh, any outdoor store, anywhere anywhere near Mount Hood, so um, pretty much everywhere in government camp or Sandy or Hood River, as you get close to the mountain, um, we'll sell those gas stations, et cetera, but the outdoor stores are, are a safe bet. Um, you can get a day pass or you can get the annual pass uh, if you're going to keep going up a bunch, the annual pass is a better deal. I think it's $25, $5 for a day. Um, some places do have a markup. Um, I know uh, if you get it through the DMV, um, there's no markup. And I think some stores don't have the markup. I want to say REI does not mark it up, but check it, check it ahead of time. So that's the story there. Um, and one other tip on, on snow parks is 
sometimes you get there and it's a shared snow park, meaning the cross country skiers and snowshoers are there, but so are the snowmobilers. And I, I encourage not hanging out uh, in the snow park. It's not a pleasant place to be if you're sharing it with snowmobilers. I'm sure snowmobiles are lots of fun, uh, but they kind of stink, literally smell bad in the parking lot and they rev the engines a lot and leave them running. Um, and they're kind of noisy. So best to not hang out. Fortunately, most snow parks are pretty well designed. Um, if they are shared, uh, cross country skiers and snowshoers head out in one direction, snowmobilers head out in the other direction. Um, so kudos to the Forest Service and others who have designed that system. Um, and just so I don't forget, uh, I'm giving out credit, um, uh, all the volunteers who help maintain these trails um, and help mark them with trail markers, um, uh, we all benefit from, from their efforts. So uh, thank you to all those folks. Dogs are uh, allowed at most snow parks. Um, look it up ahead of time if you're not sure, but um, places it's allowed. Uh, in Central Oregon, in some places, the, the rules change and are a little bit more, um, vary a little bit. Uh, so when you're out snowshoeing, depending on where you go, some places are marked better than others. You'll, you may see trail markers like this guy or just a, a blue triangle or diamond uh, tacked onto a tree. So it really kind of varies. Uh, again, some places are marked better than others, but that's what you want to keep out for. Those are your, your best signs that you're on the trail uh, when you see a blue marker. And then, uh, so lunch, tips, tips on lunch. So, you know, you've been out, you've been snowshoeing for a while and you're ready for uh, taking a break. You, you've heated up, uh, you're gonna soak up the view. Eventually you'll get to your lunch. Maybe you got some hot chocolate in your backpack. Um, plan on a short lunch. Uh, typically when you're out there, once you stop moving, uh, you're gonna cool down pretty fast, uh, especially once you sit down in the snow. Um, Speaking of sitting down for lunch, um, there are these little pads that you can get to sit on. Um, they're really thin. They weigh almost nothing. Um, you can get these for like a dollar or two. They give them out at concerts. There's usually like some logo of some company um, on them. Um, stuff in your backpack, sit on it for lunch. Buys you a little time because uh, if you're sitting on that snow, the body heat's going right out through the snow pretty fast. Um, so uh, what I would suggest is when you get to your lunch spot, uh, pick a good spot. If you don't have one of those pads, you can stick your, uh, take your gloves off and sit on those or your backpack. Make sure you take your sandwich out before you sit on your backpack. Um, and then uh, what I also suggest, you'll notice this person uh, in the photo is sitting down and their snowshoes are still on. Um, it, it is a little bit of a pain to put the snowshoes on and off. So I try, I usually don't take them off when I'm having lunch. Um, so how do you get into that position where you can sit down with snowshoes on? Um, again, you'll see the, the heel is, is released uh, from, the, from the snowshoe itself. So there's, there's flexibility there. Um, best way to do that is you, you, know, you can fall back like you're doing a snow angel. Um, and, and that'll be a little tricky with snowshoes on, but you can probably figure out a way to do it. Or uh, what, what I would do is just go down on your, your hands and knees and kind of roll over onto your side, onto your back onto your butt and, and there you go. And then from sitting position uh, out of the snows on, do that in reverse. So just kind of roll over onto your knees and then it's pretty easy to stand just right up uh, from that position with your snowshoes on. So that is my tip for lunch. And this is what you don't want to have happen. Um, here you can see my snowshoe has a 10, 10 pound snowball on the bottom. This only usually happens if it's more a warm day out and there's fresh snow. If you're on a pretty well-packed trail and or it's colder, most of the time this doesn't happen, um, but it can happen. And so what do you do if this happens? Um, and again, in the winter time, this is something that you probably won't find. This is more springtime if it, you know, maybe snowed a couple inches overnight or you're a little off trail. That's when you're going to have this. You can try clicking your snowshoes together and it'll knock, them off, knock the snow off. I find that doesn't work very well. Um, usually once you start having this, if a couple clicks, I'll do that a couple times. And sometimes that'll work great. But if it keeps building back up, you don't want that because it, it makes it unstable and you can roll your ankle. Um, it's just a lot more work because you're carrying that extra weight. Um, 
so the best the best advice I have for you in this situation is you gotta take the snowshoe off and, and dig all that snow off the bottom of your snowshoe. When you click it off, typically you get most of it off, but in the teeth of the snowshoe on the bottom, you still have a layer that's stuck in there. And, and that makes it easier the, the, snow, the snow that you're walking on as you go keep going is going to stick to that more easily than if it's a bare snowshoe. So best take the snowshoe off. It takes a few minutes. Scrape the snow off and then keep going. I've heard stories people spray the bottom with Pam or cooking oil. I, I don't think that's going to work. I think it's going to rub off pretty fast. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste my time with that. I haven't tested this other theory, but I think it, it could help. Um, which is some people will duct tape the bottom of their snowshoes. It's kind of a lot of work. It's going to take a while because you got to you know, get it pretty fit and tight around the teeth. Um, but that smooth, slippery surface of the duct tape is going to be hard for the snow, or the snow to stick to. So it's actually a good option if you find yourself this is happening to you regularly. Um, some snowshoes say, oh, this is designed so that doesn't happen. I've not found that to be the case. I think this is just more to do with, is it warm, fresh snow, wet, heavy, wet snow, the kind that's good for making snowballs that day? That's really the main driver um, and, and no, no easy ways around that. But again, not something you're probably gonna have to uh, deal with nine days out of 10. Um, so that's the good news. Okay, safety. So I was worried with the, that I, you know I give you five or six things you need to worry about, and and I make people really afraid of snowshoeing. It's a pretty safe activity. You know things can go wrong, but things can go wrong anywhere. Um, it's a pretty accessible, pretty safe thing to do in the outdoors. You know common sense, some basic precautions. Um, so I will give you these safety tips, uh, but I, I don't want you to worry too much. Um, so the first uh, one I want to cover is tree wells. And this is something that is much more of an issue if you're a downhill skier. So in the upper right photo there, you'll see how these tree wells form. Snow falls down, it lands in the branches instead of coming all the way to the ground. And so you have this uh, empty cavity here with no snow. And as the snow keeps building up out here, as you can kind of see in this photo, it meets the branches. And then you may not see, if you're looking from over here, you may not see that empty cavity um, so that's why you kind of want to be careful. Don't get too close to trees because um, they can have these, uh, these tree wells in them. So I've got a little video here to kind of show you an example of this. Now, you look at this guy. Hey, this is a pretty small tree, and you don't see any sign of a tree well. But remember, we get a lot of snow in the Cascades. It can be really deep. Uh, you may be snowshoeing on top of five, six, seven feet of snow. So here, watch him here as he's uh, testing this out. Oh, boy right down in there. And as you can tell, he's, his feet aren't even touching the ground. So pretty pretty sketchy, not something you want to do. Um, again, not really a big issue with snowshoeing unless you're you know, off trail. If you're on the trail, it's, that means it's packed down, somebody else didn't fall through. So that's, that's kind of the safest bet is following another track. Um, the one piece of advice uh, for both for downhill skiing um, and for snowshoeing that I, I have heard is it's helpful if you do find you are slipping or tipping down, sliding down into a tree well, uh, the thing to do is to kind of bear hug the tree or grab a branch, anything you can hold on to um, so that you're, you, you, you want to keep your head up. If your feet go down, that's okay. You can probably find your way, work your way out of the tree well. What you want to be concerned about is not letting your head slide uh, down to the bottom of the tree well. That's that's the more concerning dynamic. So, uh, you know, be a little wary around trees. Um, this is especially an issue with deeper snow, um, and after a lot of storms have just come in uh, more recently. So, something to think about. Um, sometimes you're out uh, snowshoeing, and as you're walking along, recent snow is still up in those branches, and it may you know the wind may blow a little bit, and it'll start falling around you. No, that's kind of neat. And, instinct is where's that coming from and you look up and that's the wrong instinct you don't want to look up because you're going to get a uh, some snow falling right in your face and, and sometimes those are ice balls sometimes as you can see in this picture here uh, they're potentially really big ice balls uh, that have frozen thaw froze thaw um, so 
if you do notice the snow is falling down around you, I've never heard of anyone uh, getting hurt this way. This is mostly for comic relief here, um, but best to just uh, keep walking, keep your head down, and then turn around and look back after you've, you've got a little bit of the trail um, just to be safe. All right, so full trails. Um, this is one thing to keep an eye out for, especially if you're out um, where there's not a lot of people around uh, or it's, it's fresh snow and the trail is, you know, somebody went out before you and packed it down, but maybe it was early in the morning and there's a lot of fresh snow. It, your tendency is going to be following exactly where that person went, whether they're on the trail, off the trail, that is going to be where you're probably going to follow unless you're paying close attention to trail markers and or the app on your phone. An example of this is I was out with some friends that uh, we were out first ones out. We went out for a couple hours. We, we said, all right, well, let's get off the trail, you know, hundred feet. We'll get a nice little private spot, you know, just off the trail uh, and have our lunch there. We packed down a route on the trail and then off the trail. Um, and then everybody behind us kept coming to our lunch spot disturbing us and then realizing that wasn't the trail and then going back to the trail. So um, just something to think about, you know, again, keep an eye out for those diamonds tacked to trees um, and other signs to make sure you're staying on the trail. Because um, sometimes if it's not a well-marked area, you know, somebody may just want to go off and explore over here or there. So um, some, something to be aware of. General rule of thumb, whether you're hiking or snowshoeing, tell someone ahead of time where you're going. Um, and what time you'll be back, check in with them. Um, one thing with the snowshoes, one bit of advice is to uh, those teeth on the bottom that give you all that traction that you want if you get into icy patches. Um, when you get to the snow park, if, you, if the snow park's plowed and it's just bare pavement, don't put the snowshoes on and walk straight from your car on the pavement because that pavement will really dull those teeth um, and that's not good for the teeth, not good for your future traction on icy spots. Um, just walk them over to the trailhead once you're in the snow, um, put them on there um, and you'll be good to go. Um, every once in a while, if it's early season, late season, or just a, a lower elevation spot, you might get to a section of trail where there's a, a patch of you know, 20 feet where there's no snow. And you know, do you need to take your snowshoes off for that? Um, you know, if it's pure rocks, then I would say, yes, um, it's worth it. Take your snowshoes off. If it's just dirt, no problem. Just walk on that just fine with your snowshoes. No, no harm. Um, they're, they're, they're pretty sturdy. All right, so now the, the fun part here, where to go snowshoeing on Mount Hood. So here's a, a map of um, the Mount Hood region. We've got Portland over here, Sandy, Highway 26, this white line that comes up with Government Camp, keeps going down here all the way eventually to Bend. Highway 35 takes off and goes up towards Hood River. Um, so you've got a couple, you know, here's a marker zigzag. These uh, blue markers are some of the snow parks that I'm going to talk about. This isn't all of them, but these are some of the, the main ones you may find yourself uh, wanting to explore. So speaking of, let's uh, Talk about the first one here, Lost Creek. So you're heading up Highway 26. This is kind of the, the villages, as they call it, or you get to Welch's and little town of Zigzag. Um, you turn off Lolo Pass Road, um, and that'll take you up towards Lost Creek, or it's called also Old Maid Flat, right along the Sandy River. This is the only one that's uh, actually kind of tricky to find um, or not totally obvious like the rest of them. Um, and, and it's also one that I... I wouldn't recommend if your car, truck, whatever is uh, not super ready for snow um, because some, this is not the first place that gets plowed or the second place. So a um, little extra caution driving out here. Um, and sometimes you can get all the way to the area where people tend to park there. Um, and sometimes you can't drive that far because of the snow. And so you can still explore, um, but just uh, be wary that conditions can vary a little bit there. It's a really neat spot if the conditions are right and you know it's not that big of a deal. Uh, again, if you've got the right car um, and wheels, good, good tires on your car is really important uh, for driving in the snow. Uh, I encourage uh, folks to check that out because uh, it's, it's a pretty neat space, um, room to spread out and a little bit off the beaten track. Here's some, some photos of uh, that. And this, this photo of Mount Hood is, is what you would see on that trail 
Um, this is very much zoomed in, um, but you do get some gorgeous views of Mount Hood uh, as, you're, as you're snowshoeing along that area there. I, I love that photo. It's just such a snowy, snowy mountain. Um, and you got the, some ice on the river there. Cool spot. Check it out. Moving up Highway 26, uh, the Mirror Lake area. Um, this is a good one uh, on a clear day um, because you get some great views of Mount Hood. On a stormy day, not so great. Um, it is one of the ones that is closer uh, to Portland, so it's a little bit of a shorter drive, but not much. Um, used to be you would, there was this dangerous, sketchy parking on the side of the highway, uh, of Highway 26. Now uh, there's a, a special lot uh, in this, right next to Ski Bowls. So if you get off from the Ski Bowl exit there, um, that'll put you in that parking. As with everywhere on Mount Hood, as we, I mentioned earlier, parking is an issue. It's a challenge. Um, there, there are no great secrets to how to avoid the crowds and guarantee parking spots and avoiding um, traffic. The, the general rule of thumb is the most traffic is going to be for the ski day. So that means people are heading up. If you're going skiing, you know, between 7.30 and 10 a.m., that's when you're going to have a lot of traffic uh, going up to the ski areas. And then coming down um, after, say, 2, 2.30, you're going to have another pulse. Um, so that's a, those, those, those are a lot of the, those are probably the times you want to be going up and coming back from snowshoeing as well. Um, Midweek certainly helpful. Um, Sometimes going through Hood River can uh, save you a little bit of time. Longer drive, but it might be faster based on traffic. But there's, you know, it's not not a perfect solution either. So uh, until we get uh, better carpooling in non-COVID times and more public transportation going up to the mountain, I think that that issue is just going to linger. Um, but Mirror Lake, great spot, great views. Um, it's about four miles round trip to the lake and back. Um, not a lot of elevation gain. It always feels longer than that to me. Um, so nonetheless, this is a, a pretty good uh, trail to check out again on a clear day. And, and you can extend it. This is, I, I think we're almost up to the summit here. Um, you can keep going up above Mirror Lake up to the top of Tom, Dick and Harry Mountain. Um, and that's spectacular views. It's about nine miles round trip. So it's, it's, it's long. Um, and the trail can be a little trickier to find, depending if it just snowed recently. I've had some adventures uh, on the upper part of that trail, um, but it's a, it's a fun one. Again, that you'd have if this you tried to do this on a stormy day, you have zero views of anything. Um, you are in the forest a good chunk of the time if you're just going to Mirror Lake, so that that, that can be doable there um, without missing out too much on views on a stormy day. Trillium Lake, another one of the lakes where you do get views of Mount Hood. Um, this is uh, a good one. Uh, this is just past, uh, pretty much functionally right in government camp there on, on the, the east side of town. Um, I did this, uh, gosh, we led this trip a number of years ago and it was just snowing like crazy. Had I known there was gonna be this much snow, I would have canceled it. Um, quite the drive up, uh, but everybody had a lot of fun. We just, every single, I think there were like 10 of us. We, it was so deep, we had to keep trading off who was in the lead. Uh, breaking trail, because you can see here on the left, um, that snow was up to your knees or your waist, depending on how tall you were. Um, it was a really fun day. Um, and that kind of shows how if you have your poles, there's you're going to be using your poles way up here. Some days it's all flat and, uh, you know, on the second side of the trail, so it'll be good. But if, if you were going to use poles at all on this day, you would need uh, the extendable, adjustable ones. So this one is a lot of people use Trillium Lake uh, as for cross country skiing and snowshoeing. You do get views of the mountain uh, from the lake, so it's got that going for it. It is in the trees, so it can be good on a stormy day or, or a sunny day, um, either way there. Uh, Twin Lakes, this is probably my go to. It's a little bit higher elevation and a little bit on the east side of the crest of the Cascades. When we're talking about weather on Mount Hood, the uh, freezing level is the name of the game. That's what you want to check. Um, and make sure you check it because you don't want to get up there and find the freezing level is 8,000 feet and it's raining. That's snowshoeing in the rain is pretty miserable. Um, so check that out ahead of time. Uh, Twin Lakes is a little bit higher. Um, Mirror Lake is a little bit lower and it's on the west side. Same with uh, the previous one, um, uh, Lost Creek and Old Maid Flat. 
Um, so most of these, the snowshoeing options around Mount Hood are right around 4,000 feet, maybe going up a little bit or, or give or take. Um, so keep track of that. If it's uh, freezing level down 3,000 feet, they're all going to be good. If it's 8,000 feet, stay home. Um, Twin Lakes is great. This is my go-to on a stormy day because it's really nice. Um, there's a little bit of elevation gain. It's kind of interesting for us, some old growth, um, and then you get to the lake. Um, it's about four miles round trip. Um, you start out on the Crest Trail, and then most everyone cuts off and goes to the first of the Twin Lakes, uh, and then you follow the same trail back up. Um, I left trip one day. Uh, we went one time. We went to the lake, and everybody was just in turbo speed, and it wasn't lunchtime yet, and so. Like, all right, folks, do we want to keep going? You know, I, I haven't really scouted it, but we can we can make a loop out of this and we're going to call it a lollipop where you go up to the second lake and then cut up to the Pacific Crest Trail and then work your way back. I knew it would add some distance, but everybody was like, oh, yeah, let's keep going. Let's keep going. And it's a lot longer. Um, there were some blisters at the end of that day, um, but everybody made it and everybody kept it was amazing pace. A uh, good group of people that day. Um, but uh, yeah, most folks, I think you're just going to want to get to that first lake. Uh, again, a good one on a stormy day, Twin Lakes. Barlow Butte, a little bit more slightly off the beaten track. Um, I really like this one. The trails, uh, the trails like at Twin Lakes, it's one trail. Almost everybody's doing the same exact thing. Uh, easy to find and follow. Barlow Butte, I have trouble finding the trail every single time. I'm usually just off exploring. Um, you can... Uh, it's it's kind of hard to get all the way up to the top of the butte. This is a fun one on a stormy day to explore. Um, if it's a clear day, the view from the top is going to be spectacular, similar to Tom Dick and Harry Mountain. Um, but the that last stretch to get up to the summit is a, a pretty pretty difficult. Uh, about as tough as it gets on snowshoes and, and still being uh, potentially doable. And 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 it's hard to find the trail. It's not you can't even really easily traverse and try to make it easier. Um, especially if the snow conditions are, are tough at all. Um, but uh, nonetheless, an example of one place where uh, this is just off Highway 35, um, where you can uh, maybe get away from people, but again, be careful. You don't want to get lost out here. It is a little harder to find uh, the trails there. All right, one of my favorites, Tamanoas Falls. Um, timed right, this is one of the best. Um, this is lower elevation, so you really got to keep track of where the snow level is. Is there enough snow there? Um, there isn't always. It kind of goes back and forth throughout the winter. Um, I think right now there's probably not quite enough snow. I think the recent rain washed away. There was enough snow a week ago. Um, so it's, it's kind of right on the edge. So you got to kind of keep track. This is um, a beautiful spot. Um, it was a little bit sketchy on the trail. Um, these bridges that you see here, um, sometimes after a good storm, you know, the snow on the bridge comes all the way up to the top of the railing, making the bridge a little bit sketchy. So you want to be careful there, um, especially as you get up close to the falls here. This is this would have take a pretty cold spell to freeze it this much, um, but doable if the conditions are right. Um, I, I would I would uh, recommend uh, Tamanoas Falls. It's a beautiful place, hard to spell, hard to pronounce, um, but yeah, Tamanoas Falls. All right, and then White River. Um, this is a beautiful one. Um, this is right uh, off of Highway 35. Um, on a clear day, these views are hard to beat. Um, you're out in the open the entire time, looking at the mountain the entire time. Unobstructed is exactly what you see in the photo here. Um, you're, you're snowshoeing uh, off on the left here. It is a bit of a circus when you get to the White River Snow Park. Um, because there's a ton of people that just go there to sled uh, right near the snow park. Um, so if you're into sledding, it's also a good place to go. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, you can snowshoe kind of right along the bottom of the canyon over here, or up. there's a little a small ridge line. I would suggest uh, maybe snowshoe up the ridge on your way up, and then you can kind of come down. There's a number of places that are safe. A couple of places where there's a, a drop off of the ridge, so be careful, make sure you can see uh, well out in front of you and there's no hidden drops. Um, but this is this is a great place to go if you're a beginner on a clear day. Um, you're not going to get lost on a clear day because you, you, you can always see the parking lot pretty much from everywhere. Um, it's just a couple, you can go as far as you want up. The views are good right from the parking lot all the way. 
Um, eventually you get to a spot where it becomes pretty steep to go much further. And that's where most folks will turn around. Um, don't go here on a stormy day. You won't see anything. The wind's gonna be howling and blowing in your face. Um, so this is definitely one of those only on a clear day to do. And if you can really line things up just right with the weather gods and the moon gods, um, a snowshoe trip on a full moon on a clear night, that's key, it's gotta be clear, um, makes for the most romantic snowshoe trip. Um, you know, you're out there at nighttime driving at night. So kind of double all the safety warnings I gave you earlier um, about careful driving and gear and temperatures are colder and all that good stuff. But uh, if things or conditions are right, and sometimes it can be a little easier to do this maybe in March or April um, when it's maybe a little bit warmer at night. Um, but again, the trick is usually getting clear skies. Um, you can head up to White River uh, or a few other places, but you know, on a full moon, it is spectacular to be up in the snow. It just reflects all the light. You want to have your headlamp and a backup and 10 different backup batteries and all that good stuff, but um, you probably won't need the, the flashlights at all. Um, you'll just be able to enjoy the, the moonlight reflecting and lighting up the entirety of Mount Hood. It, it's, it's great. Um, I may or may not have uh, taken my uh, then girlfriend up on a moonlit snowshoe hike at White River and proposed uh, she's now my wife. She said yes. Good news. Um, and I, you know, I think if you propose under these conditions, the percentages of getting yes as an answer go up significantly. Um, so yeah, so shooting on a full moon, pretty hard to beat. Um, pretty pretty fun experience. Okay, winding down here. Um, if you want to get more involved with Oregon Wild, um, you can become a member. Uh, if you uh, purchased a raffle ticket, thank you for your donation via the raffle. If you want to make another donation um, to support our efforts, OregonWild.org, go for it. That would be great. Um, as, you know, you can volunteer with us. Volunteering during COVID times is a little trickier than it normally is, but there are still ways to engage uh, via our action email alert list, uh, as well as making calls to congressional offices and or um, writing letters to the editor, um, being active on social media, all that good stuff. Uh, if you own a business and you wanna endorse our efforts to find a better vision for Mount Hood, conservation, wildlife, recreation, um, let us know, we'll get you connected on that campaign. Um, and yeah, we really appreciate your support. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we're a nonprofit and so we can't do the work we do to protect these natural treasures around Mount Hood for the benefit of wildlife, clean drinking water for our collective uh, snowshoeing experiences. Um, yeah, th these areas don't protect themselves. Let's, let's not take them for granted. Um, and hopefully you can become a member of Oregon Wild and, and support those efforts and be part of the team. So um, on that note, I'm going to uh, turn it back to Aaron and do some question and answer and I'll turn off my screen share here. All right. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and if you are with us on Zoom, uh, you can put in some questions in the Q&A. Um, we'll go through uh, some of these now. I think some of these were answered, but because we did two of these, I, I can't remember if it was last time that they were answered or this time, so we'll just go through them. Um, snowshoes, do snowshoes come in different sizes or is it one size fits all? I think you, you touched on this one. Yeah, I, I think I maybe gave the short answer. I'll give it, I'll expand on a little bit. Um, it's generally one size fits all. If you're six and a half feet tall, you might want to make sure you have just the right snowshoe. Again, if we're doing recreational day trips of four to five miles, you don't have to worry about that. We can all swap snowshoes and we'll all be just fine. Um, if you are heavier set or taller or wearing a heavy pack, um, you can get what uh, these extenders on the back of your snowshoe, which just gives you more surface area to stay on top of the snow. Um, that's more, a little more for intense uh, snowshoeing, but um, yeah, short answer is uh, one, one size fits all. There were a few questions on yak tracks or micro spikes versus snowshoes, uh, sw switching between them or what situations might warrant using one rather than the other. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, um, one size fits all for, for adults. They're, they do make smaller snowshoes for kids. 
one of the trips I led, we, I think we had a two-year-old and they had these little snowshoes that were tiny. Um, it didn't go very well, uh, but uh, they do make them uh, in smaller sizes for kids. Um, so for yak tracks uh, or, or spikes, um, I think for the most part, when you're out on trails, um, snowshoes are gonna work best. If you're on a trail that's really well packed down, um, those other types of um, traction. So for those not familiar, yak tracks are basically like tire chains for your shoes. Um, they give you kind of spikes and um, more traction on the bottom. Um, so it can be good. You know, a lot of people wear them running on snowy roads. Um, if you're, again, if you're on like a groomed uh, trail where it's really flat and consistent, that, that can work just fine for you. Um, I, you know, most of the time I, I tend to lean towards snowshoes um, being better. And, and, and the other tip I would give on this front is sometimes you might be out snowshoeing and you're coming back and you're like, you know, I totally don't need these. I can just hike through the rest of the way in my boots. I'm gonna take these off, it'll be easier. Keep them on. Um, trails tend to be inconsistent. It may be really easy going for a stretch and then you're gonna hit an icy spot and you might fall down, you might miss those uh, teeth on the bottom of the snowshoes that give you all that traction. Um, also, it may look like it's really firm and then all of a sudden you'll see somebody took their shoes off or they were just wearing shoes and not snowshoes. Um, and you'll see this basically a foot hole, that deep hole in the snow, we call it post holing, where somebody steps and, and it's just uh, not fully packed snow. Uh, you could sprain an ankle pretty easily that way. It's not a lot of fun. It's a lot of effort. Um, you can hurt your hip. Um, so keep the snowshoes on. That would be my recommendation. Um, and yeah, again, if you're out of the snow parks, you tend to not see a lot of yak tracks uh, or spikes. They're, there are conditions where those are okay and we'll get the job done, but um, I find that's more, not, not always the best fit. One person mentioned Tamanawas Falls, and I think sometimes in the season it gets pretty icy because it's been so packed down. And so I think sometimes it does make sense to use it there because it's not, it's not so much snow anymore. It's just kind of an ice trail. Yeah, and, and honestly- But shoes would work fine in that situation too. Yeah, it, you know, and again, there's the the all rigid plastic snowshoes, which have more traction, which will work well. Um, but generally, I, I'm I'm not going to encourage anybody to go out to Tamanawas Falls if it's really icy. With any, regardless of what you've got on your feet, um, there are some spots there that if it's icy, just turn around and leave. It's not not worth the risk. It's beautiful, but it's not that beautiful. Any thoughts about upkeep if you own snowshoes? Uh, one person saying that they have snowshoes, haven't used them in a while. Do they need to tune up? What things to watch out for? I would watch out for plastic degradation if there's any rubber or plastic, but any other thoughts on that? You know, I've been snowshoeing for, I don't know, 25 years or so, and I have never there's very little maintenance you have to do. I, I don't think I've ever done any maintenance. Um, I've never seen anyone else break a snowshoe. I did manage just once and it's my own fault. I was horsing around and uh, really kind of cranking on the snowshoe, jumping around and stuff. So uh, yeah, very, very little maintenance. Again, if you wanted to do that, that trick with duct taping the bottom um, so that it may increase, decrease the likelihood of snow clumping, uh, you could do that. Um, you know, you, you could be cautious and, you know, just double check, put them on at home, uh, just, you know, twist it a little bit, shake it, uh, make sure all the straps look like they're working before you head out. If, if there is something wrong with it, you want to find out at home, not when you get to the snow park an hour and a half later. Questions about Northwest Forest Pass versus Snow Park Pass. Ah, uh, yes. All right. I meant to cover that. So if you're at a snow park, you need a snow park pass. Um, you do not need a Northwest Forest Pass. That's more for summer hiking trailheads where you need that most places on Forest Service BLM land. So uh, just, just the one pass uh, for the snow parks. But uh, Northwest Forest Pass won't cover you at a snow park. Ah, uh, sorry, yes, that's correct, yep. One person asked about putting wax on snowshoes to prevent snow buildup. Yeah, I like it. That, that could be worth a try. Yeah, I mean, that, that'll, that's functionally what you do on the bottom of cross-country skis. 
so that you get better glide and you don't get snow buildup on the bottom of your skis. So um, that that's uh, that and the duct tape would be uh, and and just taking the snowshoes off and, and clawing it out. But yeah. Uh, of the trips that you mentioned, which ones would you recommend for first timers going just two to three miles? Two to three miles. Uh, you know, I, I think the the White River Snow Park is. Uh, easy to find and less likely to get lost. So I would recommend that for beginners. Twin Lakes is another good one for beginners. The trail's pretty easy to find. Um, and so for your clear day versus stormy day, stormy day beginners go to Twin Lakes. On a sunny day, go to White River. Um, those, are, those are probably my two. Uh, Mirror Lake is, is probably not, it's, depending on the snow conditions, that's fine. Uh, for beginners, but I, I would probably steer. Trillium is also really good for beginners. Um, there's a, a, a pretty steep hill in the beginning, but that's really the only uh, hill of consequence there, so don't worry about that too much. And hills aren't that difficult on snowshoes, so um, that, that's another option. Do you have any tips for keeping snow from flipping up and hitting people on their posteriors as they walk? Uh, yeah, no, I don't. Um, that just is uh, part of snowshoeing. <laughs> it, it, and most of the time, there's not too much of that. Um, it, you know, if, if it's heavier snow, you, you, can't, you can't kick it up that high even if you wanted to. But um, I, I don't know if it's certain people just have a certain gait. Um, but it, it, it is, for most people, it's not too big of an issue. And, um, but yeah, it, it, it can be a little, little funny at times. Is there any snowshoeing allowed at Teacup Lake, not on the groom, or is it prohibited everywhere? Yeah, that's a good question. Teacup Lake is um, on Highway 35, uh, between Highway 26, uh, as you're heading towards Mount Hood Meadows. Um, I, I think that's almost all cross-country skiing. Um, I think they do some grooming, so I'm, I don't think there is, but I, I, I don't know that for sure. So. I'm sure a quick Google would, um, you, there, I know there's a Teacup Lake trail map and that would identify usually with two different colors, one color for cross country skiing, one color for snowshoeing, um, if, if it is allowed there. Do you have any recommendations for a brand or a, type, a specific snowshoe that allows for the most normal gait? Yeah, again, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't overthink the snowshoes unless you're doing the really long, intense trips or you're six and a half feet tall. Um, most snowshoes are going to be just fine for you. Um, it, it, you know, any snowshoes that you find at any of the outdoor stores in Portland are all going to work uh, just great. I'm sure they will get you the right kind. I, you know, even the cheapest brand you can find at Walmart is probably going to work just fine. Um, for most recreational day trips, two, three, four, five miles. Um, so yeah, the, the, the snowshoes, there's, you know, there are some moving parts, but they tend to not break very often, um, especially if you're not doing weird things and kicking around and uh, making trouble with them. Um, that, but as far as brands go, um, MSR is a good brand. Uh, Tubbs is another good brand um, that I've, I've had both of those. Uh, MSR tends to make those more rigid plastic ones. So if you think you're gonna want more traction just to feel comfortable there, um, then maybe go for those MSR ones. Um, the, the, the tubs are, they've been around for a long time, pretty well respected brand. I think somebody Googled no dogs, no snowshoes at teacup. Uh, there you go. Um, you. Wrapping things up, sorry if we didn't get to everyone's questions. Well, one other person, wanted uh, a little more description of snow boots versus hiking boots. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's a little bit of a nuance and people at REI will, their staff are probably cringing at me right now. There's a whole different world uh, of, of difference there. Um, snow boots are generally just a little bigger. Um, they come up a little higher on your calf, um, again, to keep snow from getting in uh, into the boot. Um, they're a little bit warmer uh, both, you know, good hiking boots and snow boots are both waterproof, so that's pretty similar. So it's really just a size difference. Um, you can get, you know, sort of those 
those old school moon boots that are, you know, snow boots technically. Um, and that's really kind of a different realm of uh, footwear uh, and fashion. But um, yeah, if, if you get, you know, the, the snow boots I have, they just sort of look like uh, my hiking boots, just a little bigger. Um, and somebody asked the question that I can answer. Yes, this has been recorded and will be emailed to everyone tomorrow. It'll also be available tomorrow on OregonWild.org. Um, there'll be a link in the wild blog section on the front page of that website. Um, I'll wrap things up now, Eric. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, thank you for your support. And uh, we do this every Wednesday with a different topic. Um, so you can sign up for those at OregonWild.org. Um, and we'll also email out uh, a link for next week's sign up. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in. Have fun out there, be safe.